they'll, they say that at the top of every episode, they'll say like, send, here's my email address. Send me feedback on what you thought about this episode. And it's crickets. Like you get nothing. And so it's like, you really just kind of like have to have this blind faith for so long. And then eventually once it's working, it's so amazing, but it really does feel like you're shouting into the void for such a long time. Podcast Junkies, episode 288. Welcome back from a little bit of a hiatus. I'm your host, Harry Duran. If you are new to the show, welcome one and all. It's the one where we search out the most interesting folks in the world of podcasting and really peel back the onion on their show, their personality, their project, anything that they're doing to help us as independent podcasters, help the community, help the overall ecosystem, always want to talk with interesting folks, and today is no exception. I had just an interesting conversation, just such an interesting conversation, with Marla Jackson last episode. She's the host of the Mind of a Mentor podcast and the founder of the Also Collective. Fantastic work that Marla's doing to empower female hosts and creators in the space, and I'm going to have the privilege of connecting with her and her team prior to podcast movement evolutions towards the end of March. So if you are going to be in LA, let's make sure we connect there. This episode is brought to you by Focusrite and specifically the Scarlet 2i2 sound card, one of my favorite go-to sound cards, something I use for each and every podcast recording. The 3G line is a go-to for all new podcasters. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite and the link will be in the show notes as well. This week, I was able to get connected to Austin Peter Smith. He's the founder and CEO of Racket. It's a group that provides the easiest way to tell audio stories and connect with people who want to hear them. It's an interesting take on a voice-only application. It sort of reminded me a little bit of what was happening with Clubhouse, but I, I sort of like the idea of leaving these messages with people that can immediately respond to them. So it's almost like an asynchronous Uh, chat tool. And today, Austin joins the podcast to share his experience as an online community builder and talk a little bit about what his team at Racket is doing to amplify voices in the audio industry and focus on those who want to have their stories told. We talk a lot about podcast monetization and the incredible progress that's been made in podcast tech and what inspired Austin to make the jump from journalism to entrepreneurship. He talks a little bit about the challenges he's been facing as a creator and why he feels so passionately about the work that he does. Really engaging conversation. I want to apologize that I couldn't get this episode out in time for the podcast promotion that was mentioned here, but uh, that is just another example of the positive work Austin and his team are doing to really engage with the podcast community, so I applaud them on that. Full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 288. Remember, if you enjoyed this episode or past episode, I'd love it if you'd leave a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash podcast junkies. I'll be sure to read those out on future episodes. The other thing I'd like to read out is more boostograms. I have an upcoming interview finally with Dave Jones of Podcast Index, Podcasting 2.0 Podcast, and the fantastic work they're doing. If you haven't already, you know what? Just give it a try. These new apps at newpodcastapps.com. If you're a podcaster, encourage your listeners to go to newpodcastapps.com and test these out. I'm a big fan of the Fountain app. I'm going to be having Oscar Mary, the creator of Fountain, on this show as well. So lots of stuff happening as we get closer to our episode 300. And uh, longtime listeners will know what that means. So stay tuned for that as well. Okay. As always, stay tuned to the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. Let's get into making a racket with Austin. Sorry, couldn't resist. So Austin Peter Smith, founder and CEO of Rackets. Thank you for joining me on Podcast Junkies. Thank you so much for having me, Harry. So you, you did reveal uh, as we were chatting, getting ready that you're in Mexico. <laughs> Are you, what's what's your travel schedule look like nowadays? Not a lot of travel. I have I have uh, two year old twins, and so um, so I've. I don't travel a ton, but right now I am I am in Oaxaca for a wedding this weekend, and um, yeah, so we got in last night, and um, we'll be here till Sunday. So a rare vacation without the kids, where they are at the grandparents. Where's home for you? Um, Bend, Oregon. Did you grow up there? Um, I didn't. We actually moved there about um, three months ago. So okay. um, I grew up in Chicago, and um, and then lived in San Francisco for almost ten years, and then. 
um, yet just moved up to Bend. Where do you consider home? I would say Bend already feels like home to me. But yeah, San Francisco for a long time has felt like home. And then I, I don't go back uh, to my hometown outside Chicago very often. So um, don't have I, w- I wouldn't really call that home so much anymore. <laughs> and most of my family has migrated west. Yeah, I grew up in New York, lived in LA for four years, and home is now uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. So very familiar with the the cold of the Midwest, <laughs> acclimating myself. But I, I do get to go to a conference at the end of this uh, next week for uh, in Vegas. So that'll be fun. So um, I'm, you know, I wanted to chat about the the work you're doing for the podcasting community, but I, I wanted to just go back in time a little bit. And I know that you've spent some time, a significant amount of time at inside.com. Can you talk a little bit about the work you were doing there? Yeah, definitely. Well, a lot of my career, the kind of two threads through my career have been kind of building online community and then um, and then various types of media. So I started out in journalism and then um, running inside.com. It was sort of back to journalism a little bit. It's a news, a news business writing, uh, publishing newsletters. And so I was um, building up. We launched uh, a couple dozen newsletters in the time that I was there. So we were we were bringing on talented writers and then um, and then building the business side of it, uh, which was paid subscriptions as well as, as ads. And um, yeah, and then and then adding thousands and thousands of subscribers during the time that I was there. And um, yeah, and so inside um, is still thriving today. I was there for, um, I think, about three years. And um, and in that time, we it was kind of like a reboot of the business when I joined. And then and then when I left, we had millions in, in revenue. And um, and like I said, I think um maybe 30 newsletters and uh more writers than that and um on staff and then and editors and and then a, a sales team that was managing all of these uh paid subscription products as well as as lots of ads and now they're doing a lot of uh events as well that they've kind of layered onto that i think the timing for that overlaps with the inside podcasting newsletter sky pillsbury that's right. Yeah, I um, brought Sky on and got to know her really well. She's she's awesome, and um, yeah, and so we we launched that newsletter together. And yep, yeah. So it was interesting because uh, Sky's been on the show before. We've managed to meet in person back when people were still going to conferences. And uh, yeah, she's really passionate. Regarding Inside, I was curious if you had to identify like a takeaway in because you had a, a lot of success in terms of increasing subscriptions and i think it's applicable for this audience and and, because they're always looking for ways to build their audience i'm always um, adamant about the importance of building an email list especially for podcast subscribers and i'm wondering if there's one or two key takeaways in terms of best practices or or things you 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 saw that that worked in terms of building up a following for a newsletter yeah well i think an interesting thing is that email and podcasting are both these sort of open technologies open protocols that are similar in some ways, particularly in the fact that they're built on open source technology and and that they are just open protocols. But the very, very stark difference is that email is allows you to build a direct relationship with an audience. And that's what makes email newsletters a really powerful thing is that a person subscribes to your newsletter and and you have that direct relationship that's not at the whim of Facebook or any other kind of platform that can sit between you and your and your audience. But then podcasting kind of is all the way on the opposite side of that, where it is the similar open technology, but a person who subscribes to your podcast, it's always through through some sort of RSS reader podcasting app. And that and the direct relationship doesn't exist whatsoever, unless you figure out a way to augment it with an email newsletter or some other way of, co- of collecting that information and building the direct kind of community or direct relationship with your listeners. And And so there's a kind of interesting contrast there. And in terms of the ways that we built email. I think it's a lot of people, because I ran an email newsletter business, a lot of people reach out to me for like kind of tips. How do you grow your email newsletter? And I think the kind of, it's one of those things where the, like the answer that, that nobody wants to hear is really the best answer, which is just that it's like time and hard work, listening to readers, talking to readers and producing something that is useful to them and that is interesting to them and doing that over a long period of time. And it's powerful because it can compound over time and and that that relationship kind of can continue as long as you keep delivering and you're held accountable because the unsubscribe button is always there. And so you kind of have to, you have to keep earning the right to, to live in that person's inbox. And, and that is one part that makes it challenging, but it also is a kind of accountability check that, that like forces you to kind of 
maintain that quality and whatever it is that they came for, you need to keep delivering it. And, but I think that's really what it comes down to. It's like, there are probably growth hacks and different ways that you can maybe, maybe like catalyze more word of mouth growth. And those things are helpful, but they, but only to the extent, like the unsubscribe button is just always going to be there. And so you, you can only trick someone into subscribing to your newsletter to some, to like a a pretty limited extent, because then they're just going to unsubscribe or they're just not going to open it. And so you ultimately, it, the content is a much better thing to focus on and like delivering a great experience for a hundred subscribers is better than finding a quick way to scale to 10,000 subscribers because those hundred subscribers, if you continue to deliver something that, that that's valuable to them, then you will grow the list and it will happen over time. And, and you have to kind of trust that process and focus more on the quality that, that you're delivering and the experience that people are getting and less on the kind of like growth curve, I guess. Yeah. And, and when you say that, it's so funny because th- there's parallels, almost one to one parallels between that and podcasting, because in the same way, you have to maintain the interest of your readers week over week for a newsletter. You have to do the same exact thing with a podcast and you have to not take your listeners for granted. And I think you probably get better metrics on a newsletter because you can see subscribes, unsubscribes <laughs> in real time. And so you know what's resonating. And, and even some of the more advanced platforms will show you which links within the newsletter were clicked on and you know how people are, are responding to it. So I think that's, that's one of the things that's challenging with metrics in the podcasting space. But I think it's a helpful reminder to the listener that you have to almost like bring your A game every single episode with podcasts because you're building that audience over time. And, and that's what keeps them coming back. So I'm, I'm glad you, you highlighted that. So you left inside and then you spent a couple of years at Capiche. Can you talk a little bit about your experience there? Yeah. So I started a company called Capiche that was a sort of software review company. Like I said, so much of my career has been focused on building community. And this was a sort of community of software experts. Basically there are, for anyone who spent a lot of time buying or selling software you know that there are these review sites that are really popular and they're mostly kind of pay to play. So whatever vendor for B2B software primarily, so like sales software, email software, database software, things like that, whatever vendor is paying them the most money is going to have the five-star reviews and is going to come up at the top of their lists and, and all of those things. And we were trying to build something that was more real with an authentic community of people that were sharing their experiences with products and how they actually, the value they actually got from them and the actual price that they were paying. Cause one of the frustrations all of us have is having to talk to salespeople to actually figure out how much the software is going to cost. And so we had this kind of glass door approach of like, just say what you pay and that let other people read that and, and share the tricks you use to negotiate a better deal and things like that. And yeah. And so we built this thriving community that that's still around today and still thriving. And we ended up selling it to a company called vendor, which has, done a really, really awesome job of kind of maintaining it. They brought on a whole team that that's still managing it and growing it in the and have it's it complements their business in a really nice way so they have not haven't turned it into the kind of pay to play thing that we were trying to fix. And they also haven't, you know, exploited it just for to drive business to their business. So it's like it, they really do believe in the kind of big picture of that the value that that community can deliver to the industry. And, and so really fun experience to go from building this community from scratch to then selling it for seven figures. And in a way that we spent several months on the kind of handoff, but then we were able to keep our whole team together and continue to work on some new things, which we were all really excited about doing at the time. So yeah, so it worked out really well. Was this a service that was complemented or competed with the likes of like G2.com and Captera and Trustpilot? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Those are the pay to play platforms that I'm talking about. I'm curious just to kind of get some insights into how you think and and tackle some of these problems. When you look at a space, and this is maybe something speaking to like how you think about this as an entrepreneur and think about ideas, what did you see that was missing or or what was it that interested you to start an endeavor like Capiche? Yeah. So, I mean, community and user generated content are kind of like things that always inspire me. Like if you can if you can help someone, if you can provide the tools to help someone put some sort of thought from their brain out onto the internet where another person can get value from it, that's just a magical, magical thing that I've experienced so much in my life on various platforms that that I've been using on the internet since I was a kid. And, and so it's always a really fun kind of thing to build communities where people want to help each other and learn from each other and connect with each other. And and that particular one in running inside, I became very frustrated with, I was buying lots of, of software, like anyone who runs a business and 
getting very frustrated with the fact that like nobody has their pricing listed on the website. And, and I happen to know that like the pricing, even when it is listed is not actually the real pricing. Cause there's always deals to be had. And, um, and all the best insights that I had were from like founder groups that I'm in or like listservs of VC firms that had invested in us where I was able to connect with other founders and say like, what are you actually paying for Asana or whatever else? And, and then you get like, Oh, well actually like I know this person and they, they were able to like help us do this deal. So we're paying like, we're paying half the price per person that is like listed on their website. And, and then I could like go to the vendor and say, Hey, my friend over here is paying this price. Like, can you match that? And they would often say yes. And so it's like, whenever you see that kind of information asymmetry, there's opportunity and, and to know that these platforms that are currently out there, if you Google best HR software, you're going to come to a website that is bought and sold. Essentially. It's like some, whoever pays them the most money is going to show up there and be the recommended thing. And if you compare that to like looking on Reddit to find real stories from people who have bought that software, where you can find like much more authentic information, there's, there's just a huge discrepancy there. And so I thought that like, if we could build this, community around that we could provide so much value by by getting people to just share the types of things that get shared in these kind of more dark messaging type things where it's like it's not out out in the light for everyone to see but if you're connected with some other founders you might have that insight of like oh you can actually get like the first year of carta for free if you're a founder of a company and and you're not going to find that on their website if you go in through the front door but if you talk to the right people you will and so like what if we just start putting all this stuff out there and then the companies will worry less about trying to have all these shifty things and they'll start to be more transparent with their pricing. And I was really inspired by the ways that that kind of like move the industry and then just saw the thing that was frustrating to me, which was that like, it's really freaking hard to make these decisions of like, what am I going to use for payroll and or for my bank or for all these different things. And when you make those decisions, oftentimes you're stuck with it or you're not, you might not be stuck forever, but it's like really painful to switch. And so it's a really important decision, but you don't, it's really hard to know until you've actually like fully committed to integrating that solution into your business. Like that, once you've integrated is when you realize like, wow, this one feature that this other one has like would have been so helpful. But if we had just known that, that we needed that feature, we would have gone with their, the alternative, but we didn't know. And so any way that you can kind of like pull out those anecdotes from people is just really valuable. Is there anything in retrospect that you would have done differently at Capiche? No, but... We didn't solve the problem we set out to solve. I'm definitely aware of that, but I don't know how we could have because I realized that the incumbents were more entrenched than I thought. And so so search traffic is the primary way that is the primary way that they get all of their business and the the kind of primary opportunity would be to start to edge them out on SEO. And what we found was that it just we could compete in some areas, but like ultimately it I just don't know what the answer would have been for us to really be able to like go to war with those businesses. And so, yeah, so I don't, I'm not sure about what I would have done differently, but I definitely, I wish that we could have made it work to a bigger extent. But what we did find was vendor, which is a business that's complementary in that they also stand on the side of the software buyers instead of the sellers. And, um, and they do so with a different type of model, but it works really well. And they've kind of been a really good kind of steward of the community that we built. And so, so I'm really proud of that and proud to be, to have played a small role in helping to build vendors business, because I do think that they are moving the industry in the right direction. Yeah. And the reason I ask is because I've, I've been in the podcasting space since 2014. So I've, I'm working on a new project called uh, the Podosphere. And so it's very similar because my model is G2.com, but it's just an aggregate of like the 600 or so companies in the podcasting space at, at the Oh, cool. Yeah. So I may uh, at some point hit you up for us, <laughs> have you take a look at, based on your feedback. When did you make the shift? Because it's interesting, you said you studied journalism, and now you're, you know, you're more of an entrepreneur and building businesses now. Was there a time you can point to when you, you made that transition? Yeah, so I, I went and got my master's in journalism from Northwestern. And, and then in that program, I was in Washington, D.C. toward the end of the program, and then was working, trying to get like freelance reporting jobs and had some success with that, but not a lot and started to realize that even if I landed like my dream job as a journalist, I was literally not going to be able to pay my student loans once they kicked in, which I think there was like a six month grace period after graduation or something. And I was like, oh my God, I have to pay $1,500 a month in student loans for 10 years. And, and I can't do this. And so I like, it, I literally just realized that like, if I wanted to be a journalist, I shouldn't have gone to school for journalism. And I always had been kind of technology nerd and really interested in technology. And by that point, I was like, 
it was so clear that everything happening in Silicon Valley was so exciting. And so I like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go to San Francisco and work in tech because there's so much exciting stuff happening there. And yeah. And so it was, it was a quick kind of series of events from me being clueless about what to do with my career to getting my master's in journalism from a fantastic school that I really, really loved, but that's also very expensive to me realizing that actually was prohibitive of me being a journalist and then, and then going to work in tech. So. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. So wrapping up Capiche, talk to me about the origin story when the idea for Racket originated. Yeah. So like I said, I mean, media and content is kind of, has been an area that I've, everything that I've done has been kind of around those areas and podcasting specifically. I've been a big fan of podcasts for a long time and started to kind of observe some big frustration. So like what I love about podcasting is that it's built on open technology. And, but I, over time started to realize that that's actually not as like, that makes it sound so kind of like egalitarian and, and like, I don't know, lovely, I guess. And it's, but the reality is actually not at all that. And one of the kind of really clear observations related to this is seeing that there are hundreds of millions of people in the world blogging today and, uh, and less than 2 million people actively podcasting and, that discrepancy makes no sense because voice is just the most native medium that we have. And it, and podcasting was supposed to be this, like there's video of Steve Jobs when they rolled podcasting into iTunes in whatever it was, 2006 of saying like, everyone can have a radio show. And this is like audio publishing for the masses. And what has happened is not that at all. It's actually this like really limited set of people who are participating in it at all. And then when you go deeper down the funnel, like, in terms of who's actually making money in podcasting, it's like the top couple hundred shows are making the the vast, vast majority of the revenue in the space overall. And and then when you look at who's actually breaking through into those that group of the top few hundred, it's essentially celebrities today and celebrities or big companies launching big podcasts. And and so it's it's not publishing for the masses. And I think it also has become this kind of really self-reinforcing thing where the most popular shows are gaining subscribers at a faster clip than anyone else up and down the spectrum. And so the observation that I had was everybody knows people who are, who keep saying, I think I want to start a podcast. I have this idea for a podcast. My friends are telling me I should start a podcast. Like all, there's so many ideas for podcasts that spend years just never making it past that phase. It's like it dies at the kitchen table because the person never ends up going through the hoops of learning how to do audio recording and audio editing and getting the equipment that you need and figuring out RSS and file hosting and, and the, like everything that goes into actually like publishing an episode and, and then dealing with the podcast directories. It's not like you just publish to RSS. You then have to go like apply through iTunes and apply through Spotify and, and the Google play store and all these different things. And so there's, it's an immense amount of lift. And then you have to figure out how to build a website and have a website for your podcast and, social media presence and like all these different things. And then you actually get to the point of publishing it. And then it's like, okay, now you've published your first episode, probably within a year or so, you might have like a couple hundred or a couple thousand downloads per episode, but don't expect anything before that. And then like, and then to get to the point that you actually like have some sort of feedback loop at like confirmation that someone other than your mom is listening. It's like, it really is, is like years for most people. Like I've, I've talked to people who have, 10,000 downloads per episode. And they say like that, they say that at the top of every episode, they'll say like, send, here's my email address, send me feedback on what you thought about this episode. And it's crickets, like you get nothing. And, and so it's like, you really just kind of like to have this blind faith for so long. And then eventually once it's working, it's so amazing, but it really does feel like you're shouting into the void for such a long time. So these are some of the things I learned in talking to lots and lots of podcasters. And the more that I learned, the more I kind of realized, okay, something's broken here for sure, because so many people have something to say. And so few are actually like, this medium is working for so few of them. And so initially, I kind of thought it was, I was really focused on the kind of friction of getting a podcast off the ground. So that as a team kind of decided, we're going to start looking at these problems. And the first product we built was this kind of, it was built on Twilio. And it was basically, you could get assigned a phone number. And whenever you call that phone number, you hear a beep, and you can start talking. And you could like three-way call if you wanted to have a guest and and you start talking. And then as soon as you hang up the phone, we generate an MP3 and we host it for you and we pipe it out via RSS. And so if you've hooked it up to iTunes, then like 
you'd go in 60 seconds from hanging up the phone to a push notification, like a new episode of this podcast is published. So we like removed all the friction. It was so easy. And, and then we built a couple more products that were similar to that, like a live streamed kind of radio on the internet product that then similarly, it would like publish the podcast episode instantly. And then the people had fun using those products. But what I continued to kind of see was that it didn't solve the main thing, which is that you're shouting into the void and, and you have to, the only way to kind of solve that is to short circuit the process for someone to actually connect with an audience. And so the more that we really, really dug into that, it became clear that building on top of podcasting wasn't going to be the answer for us. And so we ended up building Racket, which is an iPhone app. It's, it has been in the, in the app store less than three months. So we're really early and it's this early fun community of people using it for all sorts of things, but it takes about a minute to publish your first racket. So you, you're capped at 99 seconds that you can talk and you just press record and you can talk and we have some fun lightweight editing stuff that you can do, but it's super, super lightweight. And the, the bar that we have is it has to be a hundred times easier to publish a racket than to publish a podcast episode. And so you go through that experience, you you talk, you talk to a friend, whatever, and you re- you record what you want to say and then and then you press publish. And what you get is it publishes to this feed to the, and it's again, it's early days, so it's not a massive community. But even today, if you go in and you record your first racket and you say like, "Hey, I'm Austin. I like am building a company called Racket, whatever," then then like people, the comments roll in in like minute or like within an hour, where people are saying like, "Hey, this is so cool! Like, I can't wait to hear you talk more about building your business, or I can't wait to hear more of your jokes." We have a bunch of comedians on there, and and the feedback loop is like so different in that like instead of a year into the process where you're actually connecting with other people. It's like on the first day, you're suddenly like seeing you have followers and you see their name and you know, there's a real person who listened to what I said and cared and followed me and commented on it. And, and so it's like providing this, it's a fundamentally different thing than podcasting, but it's providing a way for people to have to, in a super low friction way to publish their voice online and then to get that kind of feedback loop. And we see that kind of over time, playing well with podcasting. So a big part of it is a lot of people who are interested in podcasting are using racket today to kind of like find their voice and, and then hopefully move into podcasting. And then there are existing podcasters who are using it to kind of like augment the things they talk about in their podcast. And then I think it can also just live as a different thing. And so, yeah, so that's what racket is and kind of like how, what the process was to get there. And so if I, Obviously, for solo shows, is it almost like a push to talk functionality where I can just record and just say what I want in real time? And then it, that immediately goes into my feed and people who are online can engage with that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so if I follow you, then I would get a push notification right when you publish it. And I just tap that and then I'm hearing your voice. And yeah. And then if, if I wanted to have someone join me, is, that, is it set up to have multiple folks on one stream publish? So... An early iteration of the product had that and we ended up taking it away for now. And so what you can do is you can reply to a racket with a racket. So it's like an almost an asynchronous kind of interview. And so we've had like, there was a lot of discourse on racket about the, everything going on with Joe Rogan in the past few weeks. And, and there were some really interesting threads of people who disagreed with each other very deeply, but we're having this kind of civil back and forth discourse of someone published their thoughts and then someone else replied to it. And then the first person comes back and replies. So it's like kind of an asynchronous conversation. And because of the, because we're trying to keep the kind of editing burden so low, it seems to work better to do asynchronous, but we're going to explore the kind of like synchronous, let me bring a person in to have a conversation as well. So yeah, so we're, and then also another thing people do is just record, like I will do like interviews on racket with my kids or something. So just in person with, with someone to the extent that you can do that in the pandemic has been another option. And then, and then uploading audio is a feature that we're going to be adding pretty soon. So maybe you would like record on Squadcast or on zoom or something and record a short conversation and then upload it to racket or publish a clip from your podcast as a racket. And do you envision a scenario where Racket conversations could in themselves be published as episodes on a podcast, let's say? I would say possibly, but I don't know for sure because I, a couple of things. I think, first of all, it's like just almost pointless. Like the, it's so, so hard for anyone in podcasting to break through. And if you're doing it by like producing it on Racket and then automatically publishing it as a podcast, you're like, it's just not going to show it. No one's going to find it unless you go through all the really hard work, which, and so like one thing that I could see us doing is 
for people who are active podcasters, making it easy for me as a Racket user who follows you on Racket to like subscribe to your podcast and maybe in a way that lets you have a more direct relationship than you do in podcasting. And so we want to play well with podcasting, but I don't think that publishing the 99 second Rackets directly as podcasts is, at least today, I don't see that just working well. Like short podcasts like that exist, but they don't tend to, we haven't seen many that have like really broken through and yeah. Yeah, I think as I think about it, you know, that's why Anchor is so popular, right? Because it's free and people can immediately get on and start recording. So there could be a a way, like if someone was going to do a solo episode and their five minute, like, you know, inspirational quotes, and it just was literally one button push, and then you're, it's, it's just you talking and it's not engaging. You'd probably have to turn off the, the conversation feature, I guess, so people can't comment or maybe just publish my version or my path. So it's just the parts where I'm talking and people can still comment, but that stream of me speaking once a day, you know, people, 10 people can comment on my one post that day. But if you took the, the Monday through Friday, the five posts, like I can see a, a scenario where I, it'd be nice to like have each one of those be its own podcast episode and just like, I don't have to go anywhere else. And that could be its own podcast stream. And obviously no shortage of ideas <laughs> when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. And we do, we make it easy for you to export the content. So we create an audiogram of, of every racket that you can go post wherever you want to. And then, and so if you wanted to do kind of what you're describing, it would be pretty doable with some manual work. And we, we talk a lot to our users, like every, everyone who signs up, for Racket gets an email from me with a Calendly link to, to book a 20 minute call if you want to talk to me. Not everyone does, but about 25 times a day, roughly, I, I do these calls with new people who have found Racket one way or another and hear from them about what they think about it and what they, what they want and the ways that they're using it. And so if I started to hear from users, like I'm exporting these things and then generating an audio thing and publishing it as a podcast. And if we're hearing that, like whenever we see those types of things, we're pretty interested in like, oh, maybe there's a way that we can facilitate that. And yeah, and so nothing's off the table. And then this idea of engaging with the community is really valuable. There's a app called Good Pods. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they've done a really good job of allowing conversations and commentary, and most of it is text. And it's something that doesn't exist now. And, and they've, they've got some like celebrities, I think, like Gwyneth Paltrow's on there or something like that. So basically, it's this idea of like, active conversations talking about podcasts that you like and love and this episode was so good i really love this conversation with joe rogan blah 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 so it, i imagine uh, there could be an opportunity where that conversation is happening in real time if i'm a podcaster you know i could have just published an episode that may or may not in the future be available through racket because if they could play it and then jump into a separate channel where the, the live conversation is happening you know that'd be interesting as a creator to say hey this is my my weekly ama that's a supplement to my podcast episode. And I, I jump into a, you know, a specific channel and, and rack it to have that conversation with folks about why, you know, who I, sp I spoke to Austin this week, we had a really great conversation. And it may be a way, good way because I, I may actually test it when I publish this episode. <laughs> I'll just jump on rack it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And yeah, I think that that's a really important thing. Like helping podcasters grow communities around their shows is so is such an important thing. And, and I could see us doing some of those things. Because again, we want to like, to work well with podcasting, but I think it's important to highlight, I guess, what the highest order thing for us is what we see as a problem, which is the number of people that are publishing their voice online today is way, way smaller than the number of people who are interested in publishing their voice online. And that's what we want to solve is like, what would it look like if you get a hundred times more people publishing their voice online? Like what are the stories that otherwise would have gone to the grave with people and the insights and the like just connection? Because I think that's what audio is so powerful at doing is like, helping us build empathy and build connection with the people that we're listening to. And so while we want to, we see existing podcasters and the existing podcasting community as a really, really important piece of this because it's, it's people who have already gone and gone through all of the really difficult steps to do this. But we are a big part of what we're trying to do is like figure out how you crack open that funnel and get lots and lots more people doing this. And so that doesn't mean we're not interested in serving existing podcasters because we are, but, but it's also about, it's not about just that. So we don't want it to feel like Racket is for podcasters. We want it to feel like Racket's for anybody who wants to publish their voice online. Yeah, it's an important distinction. Yeah, and, and there'll always be, you know, like I said, 
I started my show in 2014. There's no shortage of indie podcasters who are always looking to try out new tools and new ways. And, and some of them will find creative ways to leverage a, a platform like that because it is asynchronous, right? It's not like a, it's not Clubhouse where you're in one room. It's basically I record something, someone responds. So you're engaging in this back and forth with however many people are in the stream, right? Yep, exactly. So yeah, it's a the interface is like a little bit kind of like TikTok. So you have every time you open up the app, you have a feed of of rackets. And so you'll hear, you'll open it up and you hear a stand up comedian testing out a joke. And then you swipe if you don't want to hear more of that. And then you hear a musician singing or a person talking about their day or all sorts of other things. And so there's a huge range of content. And then you can follow people and and there are tags and things like that that help you get into the stuff that you're more interested in. And especially as we grow, that will be really important. But it's, yeah, it's a huge range of different voices. And that's what's really fun is like, as a big podcast fan, I, in a typical week, I probably listen to, I like hear from just like seven or eight different podcasters. Cause it's like, I'm listening to these huge chunks of content. So I subscribe to like maybe 10 podcasts at, a, at a, any given time. And in racket, it's like, if I open the app for 15 minutes, I'm going to hear from 15 different people's voices. Some of whom I've been following and loving hearing their stuff. And some of whom it's like a person that I've never, never would have come across in my life and hadn't followed them or anything. And it's just like, suddenly I'm hearing this story that a person is telling about their life that like, is just so cool to hear because you get that kind of like slice into someone's reality. And so you get to hear so many, diff so many more voices, even in these kind of early days with the small community that we have. Very good. Is, is there a community feature built into the app or is the community engaging on another platform somewhere? So mostly the kind of the platform is the community, I would say. And so the way, so you can comment with text on rackets and then you can also reply to racket with another racket. And so there's a lot of voice kind of back and forth between people and a lot of the community kind of happens in the comments. And, and that's something that we're going to kind of continue to add. Like we probably will have like DMs at some point as a way for you to connect more directly with people. And yeah. And so community is everything to us. We think of like the community as the actual product. It's the people who are using it. And and so I don't know that we would be like building a Discord group or something as a different place for the community to assemble because that like, it's like if that, if real-time text chat was a way that the community wanted to engage with each other, we probably would build that into the app because we think of the app as like the community. That's what we're there to build is this community of people that want to to share their voices. Makes sense. So let's uh, pivot to podcast. <laughs> I'm curious about that, where the idea for that came. And for those who don't know, an overview, like a little overview of what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So Podcast is a campaign that we are currently doing with some friends of ours at a company called Stir and Podcast.com. So just like the word podcast, but an H at the end instead of a T. And it is a campaign where we are giving away $100,000 in sponsorship to podcasters. And the only stipulation to apply is, well, you do have to be in the US. That was because of the lawyers, unfortunately. The next time we do it, we're hoping that we can allow anyone around the globe to do it. But this time it had to be US only. But then the other stipulation is you have to have made less than $10,000 in revenue for your podcast. And so and so a pretty simple application and, and the, the winners will be receiving between $250 and $5,000 each. And so, and you kind of talk about your podcast and you don't even have, have to have even started your podcast. So you talk about your idea for a podcast and, and then you're eligible as an applicant. And yeah, so anyone who's interested can go to podcast.com and apply as long as this episode is out before March 4th. That's when it closes. And yeah, the reason that we did it is pretty similar to what I was saying. It's podcasting is, is, has this self-reinforcing kind of thing where it's working better and better and better for the people who it's working really well for. And then for everyone else, there's the mattress companies and the meal kit companies are not giving their money to people that, that are that have 10,000 downloads per episode. It's like, it all goes to the people at the very, very top. And it's so, so hard. The, I mean, the things that I highlighted, like the work that goes into it, but then just financially, it's like, you have to invest financially to get a podcast off the ground. And the kind of the scale that you need to reach before you can really actually make meaningful revenue is such a huge lift, like years. And so, you know, the, with the size of the podcasting ecosystem, a hundred thousand dollars is not going to solve that. We definitely are, are. I mean, we have thousands of applicants already. And, and so we won't be able to support every single amazing idea that we saw, but we, we thought that it, it could be a cool opportunity to, to at least acknowledge to all the folks that have been thinking about starting podcasts or that have been, have already started and, and have had to buy expensive microphones and editing software and all these things and, and aren't seeing 
any sponsors knocking on their door, like to just acknowledge like this does kind of suck for you guys. And like, we do really believe that all the best content in podcasting or, or most of it is in the long tail of shows that aren't getting that much distribution. And, and so it's, it's not something that this one kind of one-off campaign can solve, but it, but has just been a really exciting way for us to kind of like voice that support. And then also, you know, put actual cash up to show that, that we really do believe in that. So it's, yeah, it's been a really, really fun thing. The application I've been spending some time as one of the judges and we brought in a, a whole awesome group of people that are helping us with judging. And yeah, the ideas, both the existing shows and the ideas for new shows are like completely across the board and there's so much really awesome stuff. So it's been really cool to see all of the, the excitement about it. And I guess one last piece is that it's, we didn't want it to feel like it's just like a giveaway. It really is a sponsorship. So if you win, then we are offering you a sponsorship for your show or your future show. But again, we, it was all about like goodwill. And so that, so it was like, they, we had some questions when we first launched it of like, are you guys going to like force me to read a specific script and say that racket is the best app ever or something. And, and we were like, no, we're actually like literally just going to use the honor system. So if you're a winner, we're going to say, here's the script for an ad read for Racket. And it'd be cool if you read it and we're not going to check. And if we happen to notice that you didn't do it, or if, if you're one of the people who hasn't even launched a show and you never get your show off the ground, like it's no sweat because again, it's, it's like all about supporting the ecosystem of people who are interested in publishing their voice online and who are not currently supported by the ecosystem today. And are, are you tying the promotion of that directly as something that could benefit awareness of Racket? I mean, of course, to an extent, like we, you know, the, we have like in, you know, my accounting spreadsheets, I have to put it somewhere and it's marketing, it's marketing budget that we're spending on it. But it was really important that it wasn't like transactional. So it's not like you have to be active on Racket to apply, or you have to like, winners have to like download the app and do something. So none of it is like transactional, but we talk about racket on the homepage. And so people, so we have definitely like seen some, some awesome people show up in the racket community who found us through podcast. And, and so it, it is marketing for sure, but it was never about like some making the whole thing kind of like a big billboard for racket. Like we really, that's why also why it's, it's podcast and it's on podcast.com. And so it's kind of, it's all its own branding. It's not racket branding across the whole thing. And we brought in a partner, Stir, because they're really awesome. And and similarly, it's a marketing thing for them because they get to talk about their amazing tools that they that help creators with payments and all these other things. And and so it yeah, it's marketing, but it but it is in hopefully doesn't seem like shameless yeah. kind of promotion. Yeah, I was looking at uh, Stir as well and Quick 30 seconds on Stir, because it looks like it's, uh, you know, they, they, to your point, they are focused on monetization for creators. Yeah, so Stir is a, a, an amazing, amazing platform. So they do all sorts of things that help creators with that kind of, it's like the sort of back office for creators. So when people are doing like collaborations, they make it really easy to like split revenue and then to, and then also like building metrics around the different income sources you have, whether it's like like paid subscriptions in addition to ad revenue, in addition to collaborations or whatever else. And so, and they work with creators of all sorts, but, but have been increasingly moving into the podcasting space and really trying to serve podcasters. And yeah. And so they're fantastic and really similar to us. Like they weren't interested in making this like a kind of shameless self-promotion as much as just like supporting the whole thing. And, and we're going to be paying out the winners, the podcast winners through stir. And so that, so people will get to see their products and get to actually like experience how kind of slick it is and yeah and so stir is awesome and also the the website is use stir.com i mean it's also linked on on the podcast site very interesting yeah another interesting thing that's been happening in the podcasting space i don't know if you've been following it is this idea of uh what they're calling the value for value model and there's a a, sh a podcast called podcasting 2.0 there's a website called pod podcastindex.org and it's really like a, a grassroots thing that's sprung up it's being run by dave jones and adam curry of mtv fame <laughs> so uh really just uh tied into crypto and, you know, with these wallets. And so if you go to newpodcastapps.com, there's a whole slew of new podcast apps that are being developed and Fountain is a pretty popular one. But essentially what it's doing, it's uh, allowing the creation of a, of a crypto wallet when you sign up and then listeners can pay in Satoshis, which is a, a Bitcoin micropayment, which comes out to cents. And so I've, I've been testing that out. But what I, what I thought was fascinating is 
there's a, a something called a boostogram. If you're listening to the podcast, and I, I listen to the podcast in 2.0 podcast, and they get to a point where I'm like, this is really good. And if I'm on the Fountain app, I can write a comment to the hosts, and then I can put like 3,000 Satoshis, which is probably like, I don't know, 50 cents or <laughs> something really, really small. But I, I think that's an interesting way in terms of really, really removing decent, you know, because we're moving in, into stuff that's on the blockchain and not having going to go through a payment mechanism like PayPal or Stripe or anything like that. So I don't know if you've been seeing any developments in that space, but I, I think that's an interesting progress is being made because I, when you see it happen for the first time and then you hear them read the Boostergram on the podcast, it's really interesting to see how the future of that might look. So wait, I've seen this a little bit, but I don't know enough. And so can I ask one question? So that you're saying you would pay you would send money to their crypto wallet with a message and then they would read that message on air essentially. Yeah. It's essentially like if you look at the, the fountain app, it keeps track of like if I'm, and I can show you real quick here, but if I'm, if I'm on the app and then I click the boost button, you can put the number of sats there and then you can write a message here and then you send it. And then they're working on some, a better way to do how they get this metric. Cause it gets, it's recorded on the blockchain and there's a, um, you know, it gets pretty geeky because there's people that are testing out these like Raspberry Pi, like little apps, standalone, like Bitcoin wallets. And then you can see there's a, an app they've created called Helipad, which is basically, it'll tell you streaming, how many boosts are coming in and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. And, and it's something you, you can set up your podcast for value for value on podcastindex.org. But um, it's definitely cutting edge stuff, but it's it's fascinating because I feel like how it's it's moving towards this decentralized, like no gatekeeper option, because once there's 4 million podcasts under and what they did is like remove the dependency on the Apple podcast directory. Cause before it's like, if it wasn't an Apple podcast, like you really didn't have a podcast. So now they're decentralized it. they've got a service called pod ping where podcast hosts can sign up now and they'll, they'll get notified faster than whereas before they were dependent on Apple podcasts for being notified if a podcast is live. So lots of stuff to keep up. And, and as you might imagine in this space, but I, I thought it was interesting because at some point there is this whole conversation coming back to, you know, creators contributing to ecosystems, building up audiences, but not being able to like effectively like monetize like all that work they've put in. And, and, and this, this, what, what they keep calling the value for value model is really interesting because the way they, they position it is like, if you're getting value from what you're listening to, you just reward us with your time, your talent or your treasure. And, uh, and it's, it's been really interesting because people who are really active in the community, they'll, they can even update the, the artwork in the chapters for the podcast. So you'll see people. And then what they've done is they've given that person like of a portion of the, the value block. So if the podcast gets a thousand sets, the person who's doing the artwork gets like their 10%, like every single time automatically, like in perpetuity. So I, I think stuff like that is pretty fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, that is super interesting. I think, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it's something we're thinking about a lot because like I said, podcasting, it's like theoretically amazing because it's built an open technology, but it's actually become this closed in ecosystem because of the way it relies entirely on the the directories that are owned by independent companies. And and so it almost is their gatekeepers kind of are in place. And what we're building on Racket is like really is a proprietary kind of network. But as we look to ways to help the creators on Racket monetize I'm really, really interested in how we can decentralize that portion. So it's like, we might still, like the app might be the place that you're publishing content and building this audience, but how can we actually like help you build a, a direct relationship with that audience that doesn't necessarily rely on us? And because I think the approach of just the open technology, then it just didn't work. It, it led to it being more closed than it needed to be. And, and so I don't think the solution is like purely open. And I don't know, yeah, I'm really excited about it following some of these things. So yeah, that's really cool to hear about. Yeah. I'll send you a couple of links when we're done so you can check out the Fountain app and then what they're doing with uh, um, Podcasting 2.0. A couple of questions as we wrap up. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Like kind of going back to what, what I was just talking about, it, it. I don't know if I'll be able to fully articulate the way that I've changed my mind, but I think for a long time believed that just like open is better. and And that's why I was like building on email where it's like I can have an email relationship with subscribers where there is no gatekeeper between me and my audience. And and I've started to realize that it's just much more nuanced than that because yes, there are problematic ways that like Facebook has stood between people and their audience. And that's really unfortunate for people that invested a lot in building those audiences. But at the same time, the purely open ecosystems have huge limitations in terms of user experience and kind of like ability to quickly grow an audience. Like 
in the way that a person who has like really, really amazing things to say, a person who's hilarious or whatever, is able to connect with people at lightning speed on a network like TikTok that's a closed ecosystem. And on podcasting, it would take them years to do that. And and I think that's that is really part of the nature of the kind of open versus closed. And so I can't say that I have like nailed where like my thoughts about like what the kind of answers are here. But I think what I, where I have evolved is that like, it just is really, really kind of nuanced because there are ways that, that totally closed proprietary ecosystems benefit creators immensely. And you've seen it with people that jumped off from YouTube to all these other platforms and, and are really, really thriving. But then, but then there are ways that the closed ecosystems are really painful in the way that people can be deplatformed or people can can have like YouTube stand between them and their subscribers in whatever way that they want to. And and so I think that the answer is going to be some way that you can build these ecosystems to be more open, but also have the kind of centralized business that is focused on delivering a fantastic user experience and delivering distribution so that people can experience that kind of like short circuited, like going from posting content online to building an audience really, really quickly instead of it taking years. And so there's a lot more to explore on that, but it's definitely an area that that I have kind of evolved my thinking and, and I guess would say I'm in, in the middle of evolving my thinking on. I appreciate you sharing that. What's the most misunderstood thing about you? I don't know, because I don't know what is understood. <laughs> like what, I don't feel like I'm like, I have a big enough platform that people, that there's like, there are common conceptions about me for there to even be misconceptions. Yeah. But I think that maybe... Like I feel like where I where I thrive as kind of a communicator is in person communication, and but the vast majority of the way that that like my voice is heard is probably on Twitter more than anywhere else. That's where I have like um, the biggest kind of following, and so like I think maybe there, it's not a misconception, but it's like people who have followed me in terms of these like little quip quippy tweets or whatever. Like I think that they they've experienced a certain like sense of me that's just like pretty fundamentally different from how like my wife or my close friends would describe me. And so, I, yeah, I'm not sure it's like misunderstood, but I think there it, it does almost feel like there are all these people that I've gotten to know. And I'm sure it's similar going the other way where it's like, I know them as like my Twitter friends who I talk to on Twitter and DMs and things like that. But like, it's, there are whole layers to them that like, you just don't really get to see. So yeah. Interesting. Well, Austin, I want to Thank you for coming on and sharing your entrepreneurial journey. It's been really interesting to see how it's progressed over the years and and what you're building with uh, Racket and with uh, what you've launched with Podcast. Anything you, that that supports the podcast community is, is something that's really welcome. And you know, as, as as much as you think like all the innovation has has happened that can happen in the space, it's fun to see new projects starting and and just you know bright minds coming in and trying new things. And so I, I really appreciate what you're doing for the community. And um, wishing you the best of luck with, with Racket. If folks wanted to learn more, where's the best place to send them? Racket is is just racket.com, like a tennis racket. So R-A-C-K-E-T.com. Or you can just search in the iOS app store, hopefully Android this year, okay. but not quite yet. Yeah. And then Twitter, I'm A-W-W-S-T-N. Like I said, that's the best place to find me. My DMs are open. Okay. And uh, we'll make sure to have all those links in the show notes. Uh, I want to thank you again and I uh, hope you can enjoy your time in Mexico. Awesome. Thank you so much, Harry. Okay. Thanks again to Austin for coming on the show. As always, it's so appreciated when folks take time out of their busy schedules, and I don't take that for granted. And I appreciate folks like Austin sharing their stories. I hope you got some inspiration with some of the work that he's doing, and you'll check out Racket as well. Full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 288. I know it sounds cliche, but we do take the time to list out any and all of the resources mentioned so that you can focus your time on listening and not have to worry about jotting down all these uh, crazy and interesting resources that our guests mention. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil, cedarsoil.com for his list of music. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Focusrite, longtime sponsor, and looking to engage and chat with uh, Dan at Podcast Moving Evolutions at the end of March. Looking forward to that. Check out the full lineup of gear at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite. Tune in next episode for a longtime friend, Jonathan Bailey Strong. He's been on my radar for a long time and was surprised that it took so long to get him on the show. And that's really mainly on me for not extending that invite with all the crazy things that have been happening the past couple of years. Glad we were able to make that happen. Really, really good podcast. 
discussion geeking out on podcast tech. Uh, so make sure you check that out. If you made it this far, you're no doubt listening out for the retention hashtag. Let's go with Austin Racket. Austin Racket, R-A-C-K-E-T. And tag us at podcast underscore junkies and Austin at A-W-W-S-T-N on Twitter. Thanks for your patience and all you do to support the show. I'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.